So welcome, and thanks for coming to today's session. My name is Hank Preston, and I am a developer evangelist here in DevNet. And I work with uh, our customers and our partners and our SEs on how to better use Cisco's platforms for programmability and API access. But prior to December, so just a few months ago, I was a Cisco SE. And at my heart, I think I'll always be a bit of a Cisco SE that's in there. And one of the things that's been exciting for me is this transition to Cisco SEs to become developers and understand programmability concepts. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit today is what's been happening at Cisco for our SEs as they've had to adjust and adopt and evolve to be more programmatic and have access and understanding of some of these tools. So we're going to start out with the background of a typical SE. Like, what was the SE of five years ago, perhaps, look like? What was the skill set? How did they go through? We're going to spend a good chunk of time on the evolution of programming and network programmability, not just at Cisco, but kind of everywhere that you're all going through as well. And then at the end, we're going to talk about a program that we started here at Cisco called IMAPEX, which is helping our SEs really transform themselves to be developers, to have the skill sets and go out for those. And so let's start at the beginning. Let's start in the Stone Age. A brief look at history of where we all came from. Where did the Cisco SE start? What did he look like? What were the tools that he had at his disposal? And I'd like to start our journey and introduce you to Bill. This is Bill, the typical Cisco SE. He had a set of programmability skills. He wasn't completely like, uninformed, right? We had tickle scripts. Anybody a tickle programmer? You can admit it, it's OK, a little bit. I got it over there. We got EEM, Embedded Event Manager, Programming Hardcore. Who's our EEM guys? Yeah, a couple of those. And Expect Scripts. Somebody has to have used Expect OK. So programming skills. But the typical SE really was foundational in the networking languages, the networking technologies, spanning tree, loop prevention. Right? Routing protocols and those great debates of EIGRP or OSPF. God forbid somebody ask about RIP. Right? We have to understand our routing protocols. QoS, VPN design, spanning tree, super important protocol. Every Cisco SE needs to understand spanning tree. Voice over IP as we brought in IP telephony. Fiber channel as storage came through. Did I mention spanning tree yet? Right? Security policies, we've got those going on. And uh, all of these skill sets is what Bill had to know. He had to be successful. That was the expectation as an SE goes into a customer. We are the source of truth. We understand it. We are the master of the whiteboard marker. This was the Cisco SE, the traditional SE that went through. And that was OK. This, pro this profile of the SE worked. Because does everybody remember when this was the network? The good old days, routers. Switches, servers, oh, what happened? Well, the first problem, or not problem, the first change, the transition we had were these guys, vSwitches and VMs, virtual machines. But let's be honest, when the vSwitch came into our lives, we all said, that's not really networking. That's the server guy's problem. I'm not going to deal with that. That runs in software. So that's not true networking. But it didn't stop there. Things continued to progress for us as SEs, as well as every network engineer that was out there. The next step in the game, blade switches. Right? Now let's not have the debate. I think we've won over. Everybody agrees that those things that go in the back of a blade chassis, those are switches, despite the fact that some people may insist that they're bridges. And now we're just getting into semantics at that point. But those are network pieces. But very much like the V-switch, when the blade switch showed up, many people said, that's not real networking. That says HP on it, or it goes in the back of a Dell server. But those are switches. Those are networking, the network evolving around us as we went through. And this evolution continues. We come into this one. All right. Anybody know LBR? What would the LBR be in here? Nobody? Linux bridge, because our Cs are containers. Whoa. So the network went from here, where I could walk in and touch something that was most often painted teal. And that is the network. And now the network has broken through blade switches, servers, V switches, Linux bridges, VMs. Man, the network has gotten complicated. And we have to understand all of these technologies as network engineers that go through. But this isn't even it. The cloud. Oh. 
oh, not the cloud, right? The cloud has VMs, cloud exchanges, all of these things that don't even like look like servers anymore, function as a service, databases, object stores, VPN services. How do I control this as the network? But I've left some things out. This isn't everything that falls into the network. What about all the functions? Firewalls, VPNs, IPS, DNS. The network is way more than what we often think of as routers, switches, connected to servers. And we all have to understand these pieces to be successful as network engineers, whether you work at a partner, a customer, or at Cisco. We have to understand the entirety of the network. We can't continue to say V switches are the VMware guy's problem, blade switches are the server guy's problem. We have to adopt to all of these pieces. There's more, right? Everybody knows this, the OSI model of networking, right? We've all tested it. How many CCNAs in the room? Right? Now I'm going to go through, let's be honest, we got seven layers in the OSI model of networking, but I like to break them down. Right? I start out at the bottom. It's the black magic layer of the OSI model. Right? Outside of the test, we all assume that if I plug one cable into another side, data will come out the other. Unless you're one of those few people that deal with Sonnet or you really like get off on uh, optical transport. That's really rare, but typically we assume if we plug a cable in, it will work. Physical layer. Up into the data link layer. From there, about halfway through layer two, up through three and four, this is the, yeah, I got this. I'm a network engineer. MAC addresses, subnet masks, IP addressing, ports, HTTP, port 80, SMTP, port 25. I've got that. And then we continue to these other layers. Don't worry, there's no quiz, because I know it's the please God don't ask me about these layers. It's the way it goes, right? I'm seeing laughter. We laugh because it's true as it goes through. But if we think about how things are changing, all the way from black magic to please God don't ask me are important today. How many people are deploying 40 gig today? 100 gig? What about those really weird ones, 25 and 50 gig? And then I'm told that we can now have multi-gig switches. That's all physical layer stuff. We have to understand how that works now. We can't just assume that this cable will work. I walk into my lab and I grab an orange ca fiber cable. Well, what's an orange cable? Is it different than a yellow cable? What are the blue ones for? What do the ends go? I need to know this. And as applications start to become cloud native and microservice session layer, presentation layer, and yes, the application layer are becoming important. Our skill sets are growing. We have to understand. We have to really understand, not just the trivial pursuit knowledge so that we can go recertify. Like, we really have to understand these technologies now. That's an evolution that's going through. And the evolution is, it, we can map it. We can understand where we've come from. And I like to call them the four ages of networking. And it did start with the Stone Age. The, so, the Stone Age of networking lasted for about 40 years. And the most important concepts, the things that were critical to the network engineer, whether they were Cisco or somebody else, spanning tree, did I mention spanning tree yet? And VLANs, right? I need to divide up my network, I need to provide connectivity, a couple of servers, a couple of workstations, maybe there's a machine in a, a cafeteria someplace so we can check our email. Stone Age, this age was good, right? It was easy, we could do networking, we understood it. But it didn't last forever. We moved into the Bronze Age as networks became important, the dot-com era, the web era. And we have new things, routing protocols, right? All of those debates, you'd sit around the coffee table, you'd have arguments, flame wars on BBCs and IRC channels about no, EIGRP, no, OSPF, we need open standards, BGP is the only scalable protocol. And then someone's like, what about RIP? And they just get hammered. And then somebody's over there going, I'm not going to open my mouth because we static route. Right? And then WAN design. And WAN design for most of us was just, OK, our service provider is going to give us a link. They tell us they're running MPLS, and that's good enough. I'm good. That's all I need to know, unless you're a service provider. And then maybe some MPLS. And it was in this age where IP Mageddon came through, the threat of IPv4 address exhaustion. How many people sat through workshops for IPv6 designs that never left the whiteboard? <laughs> this is where we were. Bronze Age. This was still pretty good. This is networking. It was core. We understood what was going on. 
but it didn't last. About 15 years we had this. And then we had the age of the Renaissance. Whoa, things started to happen at us. It's also the software-defined networking era. And we had all these things that came at us in the networking space faster than we could even understand. SDN, OpenFlow, controllers, overlays, multi-protocol BGP. I barely understood BGP, and they throw more protocols at it. It's just not fair. VXLAN, because VLAN wasn't good enough. And if you've seen anything about Cisco products, what makes them better is you add an X. You know that's a better product. So VXLAN, VLANs for the Renaissance. Micro segmentation. How many debates we've all been in on micro segmentation. I need a firewall attached to every single device in my network. Why? Because I need a firewall attached to every single network in my device. Yes, we need better security. Yes, all these technologies are there. But this renaissance just kind of opened the door. We've been sitting fat, dumb, and lazy in the networking space for a while while other things evolved around us. And in the renaissance, this five-year period where this was kind of top of mind for all of us, we were lambasted with new things and new technologies that we had to understand. But it didn't end. I like to think we're in the cloud age now, the programmable age, where now the things that network engineers proven by the fact that you're all here in DevNet and we continue to grow year after year. Python, REST APIs, the challenge now, white box. We've got customers looking at, I just want to run networking software on a server someplace. Why do I need something specific? NetConf and Yang, we finally get an evolution, a decent evolution to SNMP. I firmly believe that had SNMP not had such a bad reputation, we wouldn't have NetConf Yang, we'd have SNMP v4 which is really what it is, let's be honest. Fabrics, NFV, DevOps, or ChatOps, or Net DevOps, all these things are going at us. The evolution of the network has gone on huge. It continues. What's driving the pressure? What's changing all of these things to go through? I'm gonna feel a little bad for a minute, but bear with me. It's digitization. I know it's a marketing term. I feel dirty just saying it. But that really is the change that's going through. And when I look at digitization of the enterprise, I break it into three things that we have to deal with. The app economy, user expectations are rapidly changing. They've got mobile devices, they've got voice activated devices, they've got all of these ways that they can interface with our customers, with your customers, with partners, and they expect things new fast. Right? They want new phones, they want new versions of the app, they want to see interfaces dynamic and change so quickly. User expectations are pushing people, pushing our developers to move faster. The Internet of Things. Today, if it isn't connected, why bother? I have a customer of mine that I worked with for a long time, a consumer manufacturing kind of goods, stuff that goes in a house. And two years ago, I sat down with them and I said, what percentage of your devices are connected? What would you say is smart? And they said, well, today we sell about 20 to 30% of our things are smart. This was two years ago. I said, okay, in two years, what do you want it to be? And they said, we want 95% of the stuff that goes out our door to be smart, it has to be connected. With all of these new things connecting to the network, the network is becoming more important. We have to scale. Security is important. Who would have thought that baby monitors would take down the internet? Baby monitors. Everything is connected today, and we have to understand the impact, and how do we secure, and how do we prevent, and how do we protect the network of the future. And then the tech unicorns. Anybody with a laptop, a credit card, can go to Amazon and start a disruptive business. It's the nature of it goes. You can like it or hate it, but it's the truth. Anybody can be disrupted today. Nobody is too big to fail. Right? One of the first ones I love to go back to is Nest, the HVAC thermostat. Turned into a billion dollar acquisition from a couple of guys with a laptop and a credit card. Every one of your customers, everywhere you're coming from, are threatened by tech unicorns. People with good ideas that have access to technology like never before, and they can go after us, and they can build good ideas, and this is good. We want to be disruptive, disrupted. Put us on our toes. This is all after us. So how are we solving this? How are we solving the evolution, the agility, all of these pieces? Well, we all know the answer. It's the cloud. Hug a cloud. The cloud will save the world. Cloud to the rescue. I saw trolls when I was making the slides for this deck. Cloud will solve everything. But let's be honest, we have the other problem we go through. Cloud is not easy. 
right? Everybody, every one of you, when you try to build a cloud, you go after it with the plan to build the unicorn cloud. It will be strong, it will be beautiful, it will solve all of your developers' needs, provide everything that's out there, the unicorn. But we all know the statistics. 95% of clouds fail, clouds are falling apart, and so we don't get our unicorn. We sadly get the donkey corn. We try to assemble a cloud. We do our best, we really do. It's not your fault. But if you just put like a party hat and like a strap it on a donkey, it doesn't, it's not the same thing. Building a cloud is not like building an old data center. It's not like being an old infrastructure person. And it's not our fault. There's a gap, there's a problem, there's something that needs to be filled. I call it the cloud gap. The cloud gap is what we're all trying to tackle and I can show it to you. It's right there. From here to here is the cloud gap. In our environments today, we are architects and operations and infrastructure people, and we're good at that. And we're providing infrastructure and operating systems, and then we have users and developers that provide us applications. And in the past, they were more than happy to take what we offered at this layer because they had time. They rolled application updates, what, twice a year, maybe once a year? So if they had to install middleware and software and tweak it and play with it, it was okay. But that's not the case anymore. We don't, they don't have the time. If they're pushing updates once a week or once a, once, a, once a day, they can't deal with all that in the middle. More is necessary. And we want to solve it, right? You all want to help your developers solve this problem. And so we compromise. Our developers come down and they say, we'll take over delivery pipelines, some basic operational tasks. We'll do automation, we'll bring in Puppet and Chef and deploy Jenkins or some sort of CD service. And we've been focused on coming from the bottom and adding automation to our infrastructure cloud capabilities, offering these pieces in there. But as you can see, that's still not enough. That's not enough today to solve these problems because there are other pieces in there. There's new types of applications and middleware. Containerization and scheduling is the next generation of infrastructure platforms. And all of these tools are filled by a litany of open source projects and products that are available. Somebody has to provide these capabilities. Your users and developers don't want to spend time here. This space is not differentiating to their work. They want to focus on their applications. Down at the bottom, this is very different from what we're used to, so it's hard for us to go after that. And so what many organizations are starting to do, and what Cisco is starting to do, is recognize that there's a third tier. There's the DevOps engineer. DevOps engineers come from above and below. We have developers that find that they're interested in microservices, they're interested in pipelines, they're interested in Docker and containers, and so they drift downward. And then we have infrastructure people that find that they kind of like to code. Python's fun, Docker's fun, and they drift upwards and fill in. So DevOps teams, DevOps engineers, aren't like birthed by unicorn tears falling on the sand. They come out of the teams that we have, and the best DevOps teams are mixtures of both. We still have users and developers. We still have people caring after the operating systems, the infrastructure. But now we have DevOps engineers, also sometimes called full stack engineers, that understand the pieces that go in. And cloud starts to fit in here. These bottom three layers, infrastructure as a service. I want to provide infrastructure and make it orderable. But that's not enough el else. If you only provide IaaS to your developers, they will not be happy. It will not be enough for them. Five years ago, it might have been enough, but today it's not enough. They need platform as a service. They want something where they can provide their code and it will be deployed effectively. And there are different ways for us to build platform as a service or IaaS. We can commercially order it from somebody and there are plenty of people that will provide these to you. Or you can curate it, you can build your own stack. And every organization will need probably both of these or a mixture. Some of your developers may want to work in a pivotal or an open shift environment. Others may have requirements that don't fit into the restrictions that a commercial product provides. And so we have to have our DevOps engineers working with our developers and our infrastructure people to curate and deliver this stack. And I know, I've seen frowny faces. We see them when we talk to the SEs. You're all feeling it. No, 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 no. I'm angry, I'm unwilling to move in. I want to go back when the network was just routers, switches, and servers. It's okay, I'm actually glad when I get angry responses. Because I used to do this and I would get denial. Anger means you have moved past denial to anger. 
This is progress. It's okay. We're moving in the right direction. But what we're trying to do and what we're working at Cisco is to move ourselves from anger to acceptance. I'm Mike Coons came in. He was up on uh, during Susie Wee's innovation talk talking about how five years ago or two years ago, we would have these conversations and SEs would stand there like this, Nyeh. CLI, that's all I need. That's it, I don't need anything other than the CLI. That's denial. We're past that, we don't get that reaction too much. We're slowly moving our way through. We need to get to acceptance. Remember Bill when I started, traditional Cisco SE? Well, Bill has transformed himself. Bill is Captain Cloud, the SE of the future. The SE of the future still needs all of those other skills, but there are new ones. We have core programming skills that are required. Python, an understanding of REST APIs. Ansible, what is JSON versus XML? These are new skills that our, our SEs need and they're adopting. And DevNet, through all sorts of partnerships, are helping our SEs come along as we help our partners and our customers make the same journey. But the network, remember the network? It's no longer just routers, switches, and servers. Our networking skills include controllers, new models like NetConf and data models from Yang. We have container networking and Linux networking. We have IoT networking. Now, IoT is an interesting one. Unless you directly are working with IoT, that's one that will come up at you. But it scares the death out of me what's going on with IoT today because of the baby monitor problem. My first experience in IoT networking happened when I was working with one of my customers. And they had IoT smart blinds. Their entire building was smart. And we got called in after they opened up because the blinds would randomly go up and down which really messed with their lead certification in the States about power utilization, when at the middle of the, the sunniest part of the day, all the blinds would go straight up in the air. It just didn't work, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I came through, and I helped out. And what I found out is that the, the engineer, that the blinds engineer that did motors, when he wrote and read the, multi, uh, the multicast RFC, he only read like the first two pages because he didn't implement it fully. And so when it was deployed on a typical network design the way we usually design them, it failed. And the, the, they were just going all over the haywire. And so we had to work with the manufacturer to help them understand the pieces they missed and then figure out a way, because we couldn't wait for the manufacturer to ship new code, and how we could adopt and adjust and secure the network for those blinds so they would stop randomly going up and down. These are the skills that are there that are going through. Now, when we have these conversations, right, the SEs, they feel overwhelmed. I'm sure you're all overwhelmed with what's going through. And you probably feel like this, help. Well, people are here to help. DevNet, our SEs are helping out with DevNet Express events. We've got all sorts of training that goes through. And one of the events that we've done is we introduced a concept here at Cisco called IMAPEX. So I'd like to introduce you to Dave, the IMAPEX reindeer. And he represents the transition of the SE into this developer persona. And IMAPEX is a program that we started where we took some of our SEs that were very passionate about development and brought them together and built a community, a community about SEs passionate about development, DevOps. These are guys that were already doing this a little bit on their own, and we brought them together to give them the tools necessary. Now, the first batch of the IMAPEX engineers are here. Several of them are here this week. And we all gathered in Denver with this idea that we were going to become developers. We're a bunch of network guys. We're going to become developers. Thank God for a couple of people. Ben Schumacher, he's one of the DevNet uh, developers that works in DevNet today. He joined us in Denver to give us some mentorship. Ashley Roach, a developer evangelist from DevNet, joined. But we had the rest of the team here. It was all SEs, some of us with different levels of experience. We gathered in Denver for a week, and we actually built an application, a modern application. It was Mongo database and API services written in Go and Python with continuous development out there. And it solved a problem that SEs had. We wanted a better way to find our content from all of our sessions. So we built an application and it worked. It took us a week and we were functional. And what we learned coming out of this is that development is harder than expected, but it needs a lot of mentorship. It needs a lot of resources available. And so we've turned this experiment into the program with a set of goals. We're tr our charter is to identify and understand developers by becoming one of them. We're building a practical understanding of the methodologies that are out there. And we're doing that not just in a classroom session. The number one focus for the SEs that join the IMAPEX program is this, 
to build useful and functional architectural demos. Put them in the hands of other SEs and customers and partners and build real demos using programmability skills that we highlight at DevNet with all of the platforms from Cisco, but also look outside Cisco for other things that we can use. Some of the applications that we build all fall into this bucket. The goal is not to do a demo that an SE can do once. Our demos need to be easily reproducible. I want all of you to be able to take our IMAPEX applications and replicate them and demo them. They have to have clear documentation, integrate multiple platforms from Cisco. And Cisco SEs are not product developers, so these are all open source projects available to the community be, to be consumed. Some of the applications that we've done, Cisco Health Report Online Information Collector, those words just filled in the name that they wanted to call it, which was chronic, because we're a bunch of dorky SEs. And it's a platform that spans the private data center to the Cisco cloud, gathers statistics about your running UCS environment, matches that against the uh, HCL, the hardware compatibility list with Cisco and VMware, and reports back whether all your firmware and drivers are accurate on your machine. A process that by hand takes about four hours for an average customer to go through, reports it immediately. Cisco Kitty Counter is an IoT application where we deploy an IOX router on buses. It uses LTE and GPS to track where the buses are, and we count as children come on. I have a young son. It's one of my fears still that he'll fall asleep on the bus and end up back in the bus garage. Kitty Counter came out of that idea. Giant ball of string. This was actually one I built. I wanted to solve some interesting problems, connecting together a lot of technologies with IoT and Tropo and Spark and communication to show how we can tackle user experience at roadside attractions in the states. I'm not going to go through them all. You can go to our website, imapex.io, and demos HTML, or just click the apps link and see all of the demos that are available. They've got videos, all the code is up there, and why the problem goes through. And these demos continue to grow as we go through. Now, as we build them, this is a lot of work for the SEs that go through. And I have to give credit to Mike Coons and my former boss here in the front row, Eric Knipp. They're in SE leadership, and they've been all in on supporting us as we go after this. And the expectations is it's not a spectator sport. We force the SEs to get out of their comfort zone, to start developing applications, to really go after it. We don't expect them to be extra expert level programming and developers. They have to be interested. They have to have foundational skills. Many of them gathered those foundational skills through boot camps and training and learning lab behavior, the same types of things you're all doing this week. They all are, need to bring creative ideas and ready to extend their technology out. And have fun. This is a picture from Las Vegas during the Cisco GSX last year. And it was a stand-up sprint review and we happened to be in Vegas for the um, global sales meeting for Cisco at our first sprint review. And I told the guys, we're all going to be in the same place. We're going to get together. We're going to do a sprint review. I'll let you pick when and where. They unanimously picked 7 AM on Thursday to come together and meet because they were that passionate. And they all showed. And we talked about our projects. We talked about the challenges we had. And we came out of this process with lots of good demonstrable applications that are out there. Now, there's resources required to do this. In addition to all the informational resources, we need access to infrastructure. And how do we collaborate? And so some of the tools that we've brought together for the SEs is we use Spark Teams for collaboration. We have the website that anybody can view. We have GitHub communities for training material, as well as where all our code stores, Docker. And we have a cloud resources that are provided. But in general, this is just around like supportive information. The SEs bring the knowledge, they bring the ideas, and that's what we go forward on these pieces. The format for the IMAPEX program is repeatable, and we're repeating this across the, the, the Cisco field across the globe. We start out with an advanced training on development skills. Most of our SEs come in with foundational skills. We give them some advanced training, and then they build some demo ideas. We whiteboard ideas, and then we break into teams of two to three engineers, and we build a demo over about three weeks, and then we repeat it over and over again. In about two hours, I actually have to have a live sprint review with develop our SEs that are currently active in this process. It continues to go. The training that they go through is called IMAPEX 101. Like all of our projects, our content, our development training that we do has all been open sourced and is available up on GitHub. And we've created learning modules on development skills, advanced Git in GitHub, 
Docker, CI/CD, and many of this much of this content is being ported and converted into DevNet Learning Labs, so the entire community from Cisco can benefit from this information that's out there. And so, in conclusion, I'm actually doing really well on timing here. You all get about 15 minutes back. Who is the new Cisco SE? Well, it's not just Bill anymore. The new Cisco SE is a family that we all look a little bit different, right? You'll see much of the, the presenters here in DevNet, we get to wear jeans. I had to present in the main stage and they haven't evolved as much outside of DevNet yet, so I had to wear khakis today. But we wear t-shirts, right? We're, we're colored hair, we're having a good time. And like every developer that's out there, we have stickers on our laptops, right? Because that's, that's like panache. Like that's how you know a good developer is all the stickers they have. So I hope you'll join us in, in this journey on the evolution that goes through. Feel free to pick up stickers. I've got a bunch of them kind of at the edge of the tables. Captain Cloud, Donkey Corn, they're all out there. So join us as we transition from being traditional network engineers and infrastructure people to infrastructure developers. So as we come through the requisite slides that I'm forced to put into my presentation if I'm going to show it to anybody, please do do your online session evaluation. This is how we know whether the sessions we're delivering at Cisco Live are valuable and important and answering the questions that you're interested in. So let me know how I did. I think I did a great job, so very good would be awesome. Right? Just a hint in case you're like on the fence trying to do the survey. And then as we go through other requisite slides, there are other sessions related to development and evolution as you can go through. But as you're in your own personal journey, if you have other questions, feel free to come find me. I'm in DevNet most of the time. And if you don't get a chance this week, I uh, scarily put all my contact information in every one of my presentations. So reach out on Twitter, Spark, email, and be sure to follow Cisco DevNet and all the social medias. We're constantly providing new feedback and information for our partners and customers and SEs to help them in this journey through programmability. And I'm super excited where we're at. If you can't tell, I'm awesomely passionate about this topic because it's an exciting time to be in technology. We have to get past the angry stage and be willing to accept the fact that things are changing and find out what it can do for us, not how to resist them. Thank you. Oh, if, are there any questions? I, I don't know if I'll be able to hear. I'll stick around up here. If you have a question, come on up. I've still got 15 minutes or so before they're going to kick me out. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>